Okay. Okay, everybody. Listen, we, we're getting um, one or two uh, technical problems on the link to the UK at the moment. I'm hoping we're going to get that squared away. Uh, but we're going to kick off on time. And uh, so welcome again to um, uh, Go Green 2, Guernsey Go Green 2. A uh, little bit of admin as we did last time. Um, there, there are no planned fire drills this morning and uh, no uh, system tests. So any fire drills that, or any fire alarms you hear will take as real. And uh, your exit is through behind here, through this door, out onto the road there, or out onto the um, uh, outside world there. Um, it is being live streamed. It's going all the way across the, uh, the world so that um, you'll be uh, waving to everybody in um, um, the east coast of America, west Canada, Va Vancouver, down into Chile, Falkland Islands, Norway, right the way through Europe, and now to Australia. But we know there's a lot of interest in what we're doing, and um, so that uh, I think that what you'll find from this morning's um, uh, um, conversation is that this is, it is an ongoing journey, what we're doing, uh, and we are absolutely aimed on these three uh, seminars on the elections in Guernsey, to make sure that that uh, is the focus of uh, Guernsey Go Green. The microphones that we've got, when it comes to question time, and I hope that our links into the UK will work correctly, uh, we will be uh, handing around a mic uh, to allow people to um, get their, um, their question absolutely to the, our two technical and financial people in the UK. Um, and uh, that may be a little bit slow as you move that around, but it will be the way to do it. Now, for those of you who were here last week, uh, you'll remember I'm, I'm deaf, uh, six, 7,000 hours flying aircraft, so if, if my answers don't match your questions, shout, but louder. <laughs> okay, so um, here we go then. Uh, that's, that's our one, and where are we? There we go, okay. Um, so the, the update we're doing today is uh, really just to take these three steps that we're taking um, uh, into the election time. Uh, from last week, a lot, three weeks ago, we've taken some good steps forward, especially in the financial areas of this uh, um, uh, process. And, uh, but what we're going to do today, my colleague over here, Richard, will be coming on to give you a, a little bit of an overview on the marine side of this very shortly. Uh, and then we will uh, look at the questions and answers on aircraft design and finance. Uh, and then a little bit right at the very end on uh, investments. Now, who have we got today? Well, my, I'm Mark Harrison, for those of you who uh, weren't here last time. My background is uh, Rolls-Royce, 1970-71. I started there, got my little tie, bought that in a little uh, tie pin that I got in 72. And um, I see we've got a, another Rolls-Royce, one or two other Rolls-Royce people around here. You'll find that um, um, uh, there are other Rolls-Royce people, quite a lot of Rolls-Royce people um, uh, involved with this project one way or another. Uh, and you'll perhaps meet some of them later. Uh, next to me, David Haler, you'll meet him earlier on. Uh, David and I um, learnt to fly helicopters together in the late 80s. He was working for British Airways helicopters, I was working for Bristow's, and, uh, but we were both trained by Bristow's at that time. And our, our careers have followed a similar path, um, North Sea oil and gas, and then uh, in my case, sort of worldwide helicopter operations. David went worldwide uh, operating helicopters, but then also um, managing and uh, directing various uh, overseas and UK uh, commercial air operations, uh, including uh, for Westland Helicopters. He was sales director for Westland Helicopters. Paul Hutton up there. Paul is uh, the CEO of Cranfield Aerospace uh, Solutions up at uh, Cranfield in Bedfordshire. Uh, Paul's background was originally in the military. He was a REMI uh, engineer and uh, then has gone on into commercial world uh, some years ago and now heads all of the projects that are going on up in uh, Bedford, which are considerable. There's a lot of different projects. Go onto their website, look up Cranfield Aerospace. It's very, very worthwhile looking through that site. It's connected with the, um, the uh, um, university there, but is a commercial and separate venture. But there's an awful lot going on up there. 
Richard, my colleague, uh, Richard Nettleton, runs his own operation here, and he'll explain that to you in a minute, but he and I are working together uh, on this and uh, on the marine operation side of this. Now, the um, finance uh, side, as I say, has come a long way recently, and uh, I'm very pleased with that, and we'll look at that in a little while. Um, operationally, we've, we're getting a lot of clarity into exactly how the, these operations must work now, uh, and we know when the sort of time scale of that is going to be, it'll be in the early part of next year, uh, and so the, all of that clarity is coming well into focus now. As I said earlier, the, pro the, the issue here we're going to do is the politics of this. We've got to get the green, sustainable energy um, uh, policy firmly in place within the states of Guernsey, states of Oregon, states of Jersey, and the coronavirus has actually helped that, strange as that may seem. Uh, it's completely knocked the aviation world sideways, and you will have seen recently, I'm sure, how far away the um, likes of uh, British Airways, they're scrapping 32 jumbo jets, but they're not the only ones. Those aircraft can never fly again, they'll just be scrapped. All across the world, that age and that level of aircraft are being taken out of service, and the focus is coming on to sustainable uh, aviation, electric, but hydrogen powered, a lot of it uh, in the er early stages, and all the big jets will continue to be hydrogen powered. But instead, so instead of running on the paraffin, they'll run on hydrogen. Um, we are expecting to be in the hustings uh, in Guernsey for the, the uh, um, elections on the uh, October the 7th, and we'll be meeting all of the politicians and candidates there and hopefully um, um, bringing them on side as to what we're <coughs> hoping to achieve here. The, the Channel Island launch... Uh, for electric aviation is important, and I said it before, I'll say it again. Of all of the venues worldwide, the Channel Islands has been chosen because it's got short routes, it's got the finance industry, uh, it's got an absolute need, and it's got a very good history for the electric aircraft, uh, for, um, for, for the Islander aircraft, and as we're using the Islander uh, for the first electric aircraft, that absolutely makes sense. So uh, why are we doing this? Well, it's sustainability again and again and again. Sustainability, global warning, we have got to get that sorted out. And as I was saying, the, uh, um, the economic um, consequences of, of COVID-19 are so massive, we're only just starting to understand those now. And so that everything we do, all of the sustainable work we do, has got to have a positive uh, financial benefit to us. It's got to be a positive financial motive for doing it. It's got to leave us with, though, a full green legacy for our future generations, for our children and their children. They have got to be landing up with something that we can be proud of. Currently, our situation is dire and we've got to get that sorted out. So what are we going to do? We're going to reduce the um, carbon emissions to zero and using hydrogen fuel cells in the electric uh, um, Islander, that means that aircraft will be flying completely carbon free, carbon neutral, and if that service is within the Channel Islands, then the whole of the Channel Islands will be operating inter-island carbon free. That will be in four years time, uh, and uh, before then we'll be operating the Piston Engine Islanders to get all of the, uh, the uh, systems in place, the ticketing and all that side of life sorted out. But we will be the first island group anywhere in the world to be operating fully carbon free. And um, that's a fantastic thing to be able to say. It's partly because the energy coming into the islands is certified carbon free. Uh, and so that we'll be making hydrogen with carbon free electricity, putting that in our hydrogen fuel cells and flying the aircraft carbon free. Energy costs come down 90% and I know that sounds incredible. Go and ask Guernsey Post, because that's exactly what they're doing with their electric vehicles. They've got their PV cells on the roof, and they're operating uh, 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 with that type of reduction. It's fantastic. Noise reductions are 65%. Uh, those of you who were here last time, you will have seen the little um, um, uh, beaver aircraft flying. 
very, very quiet, electric beaver, and anybody who's looked at uh, a piston engine beaver will know just how noisy they used to be. Maintenance goes down by 50% on electric aircraft, and that's fantastic <coughs> because it gives us this bottom line of reduced costs, reduced seat costs, and therefore a far, far better environment in which to work. Now I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Richard Nettleton now. He's going to give you about four, five, eight slides on uh, Waterside, on his work on um, uh, the electric boats, and we'll go from there, and then I'll come back. Okay? Okay. Uh, here we go. Right. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Um, <coughs> my name is Richard, Richard Nettleton. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank... Uh, Thank, hang on a second. Okay, uh, I'd just like to thank Mark for involving me in this project and um, everything that I can try and bring from the marine side of things. I'd be happy to, to, uh, to push it forward here in Guernsey. Um, today is a very brief, very, very brief overview of what is a massive subject, as I think a lot of you know. Um, I've been told to keep it to three or four minutes, five minutes, so I will do that. Um, and then we'll be back again on the 5th of October for a slightly bigger um, presentation with more speakers and information. So the name of my company is Waterside, Waterside International. Um, I, have, I grew up in Guernsey, but um, have been away for the last 20 years, more or less, and living in Italy and Spain, amongst others. Um, returned to Guernsey three years ago. Waterside is a marine consultancy business, and I specialize in the superyacht industry. Um, I have a project, Super Yachts Guernsey, here in Guernsey, to, to um, promote um, Guernsey as a, as a corporate solution for, for many um, superyacht owners and management companies. Um, I also collaborate with a, a network of shipyards and superyacht captains to help manage their projects. So I come very much from a, a technical shipyard background, um, which is another reason why I'm involved in the potential building and construction of these new eco vessels. Um, we have a passion for sustainable marine transport uh, solutions, as I said, um, uh, promote and introduce clients to Guernsey, so that's Super Yachts Guernsey. And we also work in the private aviation sector um, from a charter perspective. Um, a lot of the super yacht owners um, require that kind of service. We also work from the other side as well, promoting the sale and charter of yachts to interested individuals and family offices. Um, and that is ongoing, as you can see from the websites waterside.co and you can get more information there. Um, I lived in Spain for about eight years and I was very much involved in all sorts of projects but the most recent of them was a um, was first inspired by the boat you can <coughs> see over there which is covered in solar panels which is not the case for us but that was um, um, the original inspiration which was called Planet Solar which is from Switzerland and um, has done an around-the-world trip only powered by solar energy. However, solar energy is not enough to power a passenger vessel because of the weight and the, and the required speed. So therefore, we um, transferred towards hydrogen fuel cell te technology and we have a project ready to go for Spain. So this is a bit of a coincidence, really, and... Um, I'd be more than happy to bring that project here and transfer all the, um, the connections that we have gathered over the years to Guernsey. Um, the project was to connect mainland Spain with the Valeric Islands. So there were three routes, a um, place called Denia, which is the closest point in Spain to the Balearic Islands. It's a 60 mile trip. Um, and then between the Balearic Islands, Ibiza, Formentera, and then again in Spain, in the cost, on the Costa Blanca, up and down the coast, 
All of this has caught the attention of the King of, Sp King of Spain, who personally has written to us congratulating us on everything and, and willing us to go forward. Um, the King of Spain, not his father, by the way. <laughs> it's nothing to do with his father. <laughs> Um, but he didn't give us any money, so don't worry. <laughs> um, as a result of that, there's a massive interest from central government in Spain, um, regularly contacted by top ministers, inviting us to present the project in Madrid, um, which we continue to do, but we are working on the funding side of things at the moment, and um, we'll see where it leads us. So that presents me with the opportunity to bring plenty of knowledge, connections, and experience to the Channel Islands from Spain. Um, and I, as a result, I have extensive relationship with project managers, naval architects, suppliers, and manufacturers in this field, which is a massive field. Um, on another note, as a result of the Spain project, Waterside is a member of the Solar Impulse Foundation World Alliance. Um, Solar Impulse was a as many of you will know, was a um, solar-powered airplane that went around the world. And um, there is a foundation attached to that which is dedicated to promoting renewable projects around the world. Um, it provides a global platform um, from South America to Australia to Africa to, to here. So Waterside is already on the map. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, on the right-hand side there, that's all the, all the projects. And when we zoom in on Guernsey, you'll see that Waterside is there as the uh, representative. And there's a quick map just to show you where in Spain we were doing all this. Mainland Spain to the Balearics there. Which takes us to Guernsey. Um, a massive potential here, which I'm really excited about. Um, to bring marine travel here to the Channel Islands, um, silent travel, no pollution, and um, I must stress that all of this is subject to a feasibility study, which is the next stage in this project. Um, I don't want to promise anything. Um, I don't want to create too many headlines. <laughs> um, <coughs> It will depend on the routes that we do and uh, the realistic distances that we decide to cover, um, the costs of the vessel. Um, we have all the best possible contacts at shipyards and, and partners around the world to get the best possible solution. Um, and then, of course, the production of the hydrogen, the management maintenance. Um, and then, of course, it will all depend also on public demand. Um, you know, um, if there are enough people to use the service, the ticket prices, and to create a realistic business model. Um, our first proposition is Guernsey Home, in collaboration with Home Trident, which would the idea would be to refit the current vessels with with um, hydrogen technology. Um, stage two. Guernsey to Sark, stage three, Guernsey Alderney, and Guernsey Jersey. So keeping it very much a Channel Islands operation. Um, we'd love to go further afield, but we'll, we'll see what the technology uh, brings over the years. Um, just to give you a very quick overview of how a boat like that would work, we would use renewable energy, um, so solar, wind, um, to power a hydrogen production facility in the port, um, which I'll sh would look like that. This is, I'm going jumping forward a bit, but on the side of the vessel you have the production facility, which is then pumped into the, into the vessel. Anyway, going back. That liquid hydrogen which is produced is then transferred to the vessel. Um, hydrogen um, is put into the hydrogen fuel cells, which is how the electricity is generated. That electricity is then uh, stored in the onboard batteries. 
and those batteries are used to power the electric motors which propel the vessel. We can also add solar panels around the vessel to help power the lights and extra amenities and facilities, passenger comfort and all that. Again, all of it subject to a feasibility study and um, that is the next stage and I hope, um, I hope that helps give a very general overview and um, we'll see what happens. So I'll pass back to, uh, to Mark. There's that, that is a graphic representation of the vessel that we, have, we are imagining. So, and that is a very advanced project in San Francisco in America, which is doing exactly the same thing that we would like to. It doesn't exist yet, but they are an inspiration for where we are now. So. Will you be taking questions later? Work very, very soon. Yeah. In, in fact, what, what I'll do, I've got about four or five slides which are um, uh, just to give the uh, route into the aviation part of this. And then, uh, then we'll be taking full questions from uh, either Richard or I or into the UK. Okay, so what we've got then on the green air side of this, and dominantly this will be the aviation operation today that we'll be looking at. Um, the green air is the name that we are going to be operating under. That will be the aviation company. It's going to be based in Alderney, and uh, it shall sh achieve the full and overt support of uh, states of Guernsey and states of Alderney. That's extremely important. We're not asking for their money, but we do need their moral support, and we do need that they should come uh, to be happy with what we're doing and knowing that this is going to be a, cha a, a pan-Channel Island operation, uh, but that the world focus will be on the Channel Islands as a result. We shall fund ourselves. We don't want any money. We've got money coming in, and we'll look at that in a little while. It will be a two reg operation, so the aircraft will, the islanders will be um, registered in Guernsey and controlled under the uh, Guernsey D uh, Director of Civil Aviation and Guernsey Law. The, we expect to be uh, and plan to be the, the champion and the specialist of the 10 to 20 seat aircraft. Now that would be the islanders and in this case the Dornier 228. Uh, so the, the sub-regional aircraft, those aircraft that we know we can function and operate highly efficiently and reduce our costs, uh, reduce costs to the passengers with uh, by uh, all the experience we have uh, across the world before. That's what we're going to be doing. The Islanders, uh, well, we're going to be uh, commencing operations in uh, late quarter one, 2021. They initially, it will be two aircraft based in Alderney, uh, and they will be leased. Uh, we will be leasing the airline buildings that are coming up for um, release, end of lease, uh, very, very shortly up there, operating out of there. The piston engine islanders and the electric islanders, and as they are converted over, they will be leased aircraft from the uh, um, e flight systems. Uh, which we are setting up specifically to allow electric aircraft across the world to stabilise their cost of ownership and stabilise their cost of, own, uh, of operation. The um, AOC will be in uh, a, a contract with an existing two-reg AOC operator and so that none of the original startup costs for a new AOC, that will all, we will not have that because we will be using in collaboration with an existing well-established operator. Now the Dornier 228s, they're in the ownership of Orini. Orini, uh, as with every other airline in the world, have got very, very significant uh, financial problems as a result of COVID. Uh, and there will be uh, um, significant reorganisation going on. As you know, that there is reorganisation going on. They're changing their um, um, chairman and their CEO at the same time, very, very soon, in uh, the first week of October. Uh, and so that they've got an awful lot on their plate. We expect, though, to um, commence operation with the two... Uh, Dornier 228 NG aircraft in the late quarter 2021 and they will be wet leased by us by Green Air 
from Ulrini. The um, Ulrini would be the AOC operator. Now, a wet lease is a, an agreement between an owner operator and a, another company whereby the um, owner operator has the, he provides the aircraft, he provides the air crew, provides the maintenance, and he provides the insurance and that the other party, which in this case is Green Air, will provide the routes and the uh, passengers. So that, that allows this, the split there, or really contain uh, uh, full control of their aircraft, full control of all of their AOC uh, uh, responsibilities, but we will provide the routes and we will provide the passengers. We will also provide to Orini a fixed Le um, uh, lease profit to them so that that agreement will allow them to know exactly how much money they've got every month coming in. We know it will be set at a level which will allow them a reasonable profit um, but it will allow us to be using the aircraft around the islands. Uh, in fact, it will be Aldney to Southampton, that route and within the southern UK we know we can make uh, some good uh, routes out of those uh, and that will make the total mass of aircraft we are operating, it gives it the critical mass which is so vital to provide a robust uh, operation. A very, very small operation such as a, a just a two islander operation here, it is immensely difficult to make that work. A bigger operation, which where is where the islanders will get to. They will be eight islanders operating between the islands here. But it still needs a greater critical mass. It needs the 20-seat aircraft. It needs to be pulling in uh, um, passengers from the UK, and not just from the Southampton, the, the southeast of the UK, but right the way down into the southwest. So everything in the <coughs> southern part of the UK, we want to be pulling in here to boost our tourism industry, boost the numbers on the aircraft, uh, the operation, uh, and strengthen the Channel Islands, but also focusing world attention on the green operation that we're achieving here, because the Dornia is next in line to that. So um, we will be then, once we've got the Islander sorted out, we'll be scaling that up, electrifying the Dornia, again with hydrogen fuel cells, and then we'll be operating that as well. Now, we mentioned funding last time, and then it's uh, to Jeremy's questions. <laughs> He's nearly there. Um, the funding rounds were £7 million, £20 million, and £100 million. Those are the three rounds which will take us to brand new 20-seat uh, electric aircraft. Round one, we haven't actually started even trying to get our money yet, but we are already up to 30% uh, of that first requirement. People are absolutely wanting to come in on this and we do not believe there will be any problem whatsoever in doing so. Now that gets us to questions and I hope then you'll be in business to pick up from our colleagues in the UK. Now what is the, the situation there? We can't get video but we can get... No, no, they'll come through. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Okay, well as soon as they come through um, uh, we can start those questions. It's the Rolls Royce Club here. We're, we're doing all right. Yeah. The Rolls Royce handshake. Okay, so who's got some questions? And we'll see if we can get that going. We have had problems with the links to the UK, so please um, bear in mind. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Jeremy Smith is um, currently a deputy and I'm um, standing again. I can tell you that now, according to the press, I can uh, announce my candidacy. Um, my question is for, for Richard. Uh, it, it's really about um, the uh, um, re-engineering re of the, uh, of the uh, Tridents and uh, other conventional ferries. Um, why the decision to go for hydrogen fuel cells and not simply just power the engines with hydrogen? Um, uh, uh, that seemed to me to be a sort of step too many. Uh, why run that risk? Um. <laughs> it, it, could go, it could go either way, and in fact with larger jet aircraft it will be hydrogen only, just a straight um, change of fuel, fuel control system for hydrogen. 
Um, in, in this particular case, we think that uh, the hydrogen fuel cells are likely to be the best way to go. But uh, as, as Richard says, it's, it's early stages yet. It could go either way. And so there's no final decision on any of no. them. That's very on the, on the nice. aircraft, the hydrogen fuel cells are definitely the way to go because they provide, uh, we're struggling for weight as we always do in aviation, and the battery technology is advancing correctly, but it, we are not achieving the uh, very, very significant step change that we need. There's incremental changes going on all the time. You're getting a better 2% per year. It's not enough, but the hydrogen fuel cells will give us that jump, and so we'll retain the payload that we need with the aircraft uh, and uh, we will get so the hydrogen in that sense is being used as a transmission um, system uh, so you're going from electricity to hydrogen to electricity um, but in in the coming years it will be batteries only on the aircraft on the smaller aircraft so hello paul uh, as um as a pilot how does the uh, procedure differ what's the beast like to drive for do electric you, aircraft for an aircraft and do what sort of length would you need for a runway yeah with, with uh, electric well, motors well the performance of the aircraft uh, will be identical to the current aircraft so runway performance the vertical performance uh, all of that will be absolutely identical because that's how it's being organized um, when the aircraft are being this modification is being designed what we've done and what is common up at, uh, with Paul will tell you, is it's done with a, a, a quite a large matrix and you work out what, the, what are the parameters you want to achieve, what are their priority, and you get the coloration of that chart and you work to it. Now in this case, uh, runway um, uh, length, uh, takeoff distance is important. The simplicity of running the, the pilot's side of it is critical, but in actual fact would be far, far easier, simpler, than with a uh, piston engine aircraft. Uh, so that you'll find, and you'll find that right the way across with aviation, the cockpits, if you look at a cockpit now to a cockpit 40 years ago, they're far, far simpler. Uh, the redundancies in the system, which Paul will tell you about, uh, are increased so that all of your levels of safety remain constant or bettered, and all of the pilot workload is reduced uh, which is what we're trying for all the time. Mm -hmm. Hold on. This should be try try getting your questions also into uh, the U into um, uh, our, our UK colleagues, and hopefully that will work. Uh, morning. Um, where do you where do you think you're going to source eight or uh, eight islanders from in such short notice? Where where would we get them from? Yeah. There's loads of islanders around. So you've got to use old ones. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, the, the part, the reason, one of the reasons for using uh, the converting existing aircraft at this point in our transition to sustainability is the carbon um, footprint of those aircraft has been paid. We've made those aircraft, and everything associated with them has been paid. Uh, um, so that there is no, if you make a new aircraft, you will have a footprint of some kind. And so it is far, far better to um, modify air existing aircraft currently. And that's what will happen with the Islander. There's 700 of those worldwide. We're going to be modifying probably up to about four to 500 of those. Dornier 228, well, there'll be three to 400 of those being modified. The um, Twin Otter. Again, worldwide, there'll be uh, probably four to 500 of those being modified. Once you get beyond those three aircraft at this level, you will be looking at brand new aircraft. Uh, that will be in about eight to 10 years time. And the first one is likely to be something along the lines of the ES-19 in uh, um, Hart Aerospace. It, I, I suspect myself, it will be a coalescence of that design and a another which is coming together in the UK. Also, uh, you, will they have to be a uh, two pilot operation? The Islander was certified in 1965 as a single pilot IFR aircraft. The modification that we are doing now will continue that. It will be under what is known as an STC, a supplementary type certificate, and the aircraft will be single pilot IFR. 
The Dornier 228 is two crew. It's a, a multi-turbine engined aircraft. It's a complex aircraft, and that is two crew. Twin Otter the same, uh, and, uh, and the ES-19 will be a two pilot operation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. I did indicate to you I'd be asking this question. What uh, intellectual property is either in the company at the moment or is in development in the company? In the intellectual property for the Islander is held uh, for the um, Islander itself currently is owned by Britain Norman. The intellectual property for the STC will be owned by Tranfield Aerospace uh, and they will be the sole owner of that uh, uh, STC. That question did come up as um, uh, because there was a, a wish to have joint ownership of the STC between Britain, Norman and, and Cranfield, but that is not possible. Um, with STCs, there has to be absolute ownership uh, to allow absolute uh, responsibility uh, for their, that, and so that's the way it's done. And in this case, all of the design work and uh, the um, uh, investment is going in through Cranfield, they will be the STC owner. Good. Hi guys, I've got one for the uh, people on the phone in the UK. Um, just asking about some of the, the sort of the wider or the longer term roadmap for um, electric kind of aircraft. What, what does that look like? What sort of timelines are we working towards? Um, and are there any kind of critical milestones that we need to hit along the way? Um, you know, what are the things that we need to kind of pass or check through in order to get this um, kind of used more more widely? Paul, I would think that's for you, is it? Yeah, okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Paul Hutton, uh, Chief Exec of Cranfield Aerospace Solutions. Um, so yes, we've got a, um, a multiple phases to Project Fresson, which is the uh, what we call uh, the Islander project and the, the subsequent uh, phases. So the conversion of the Britain Norman Islander <clears throat> will it initially be a 30 month flying demonstrator project that kicked off last October. Um, that is a, a flying demonstrator project part funded by the UK government. So it's an 18 million pound project and the government's put in 9 million. Um, that gets us after 30 months, and that we're teamed on that with uh, Rolls Royce doing the power management and Dennis Ferranti in the UK doing the electric motors. Um, that will get us after that 30 month project to a, a flying demonstrator to prove the technology. We will then roll that, um, that milestone into productionization of that um, uh, demonstrator technology and certification. And that phase will be 12 to 24 months. Uh, the variability there being um, obviously that element is partly controlled by the regulator so it could take 12 months to get their approval it could take 24 and that will either be with the uk caa or with uh, eansa depending on on which way we've we've gone by then so that's phase one of of um press on and that will get us the certified stc to convert um britain norman islanders around the world in parallel with that, uh, and starting up over the next few months, will be a project to look at converting a 19-seat, as been described, a 19-seat aircraft, uh, and resulting in an STC. And that project will follow a similar pattern to the 9-seat. Um, and by the way, the reason that we're going to do conversions initially is, as you can imagine, aerospace, uh, the aircraft world is very highly regulated for safety. And therefore, if your aim is to move quickly to get a, uh, a solution that reduces carbon, the quickest way to get that through the regulator is to start with an existing aircraft, because then you're only, and it's a big only, but only changing its propulsion system. Everything else in the aeroplane largely stays the same. So it's a rapid way to get the nine seat and then the 19 seat aircraft flying emissions free. Um, so the 19 seat conversion will be phase two and then we'll roll into phase three in, in parallel and that will be the design uh, of a new 19 seat uh, aircraft 
to then wrap that design around the propulsion system that we've been um, certifying in the first two phases. And then ultimately that can roll into phase four, which would be a, a larger regional sized aircraft, 70, 80, 90 seats, um, that would uh, emerge uh, from that program. So that's the, the overall program. But going back to phase one, absolutely even within that demonstrator project, that will have significant uh, milestones, uh, ground testing, um, and then uh, initial testing, uh, flight testing of the electric subsystems prior to putting the, the final uh, production version of the uh, propulsion system on board. Yeah. So, um, just very quickly then, when, when, do you, when is the earliest that these kind of aircraft could be sort of moved into widespread commercial use? If, if kind of all the tests are passed relatively quickly and the phases are moved. So, yeah. Yes, we're talking about 2023-24 for the STC to be embodied on the first Islanders, uh, a fully certified um, modification to be embodied. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to interrupt if anyone else has a question. Um, I've very a long time now. I've been interested in uh, in hydrogen as a fuel, and I did make some inquiries a few years back uh, about uh, using it domestically. Uh, there were two major problems. Uh, one was storage, uh, and I think that's been solved largely by the um, fuel cells which you're going to be using. But the other big uh, problem was uh, the economics, the cost of it. Um, could you just take me through the journey that's, to, uh, that's evolved recently with regard to the technology and the economics of the whole thing? I think what would be best with this, Paul, is if could you do the um, a bit on the hydrogen fuel cells for me and I'll do a little bit on the local infrastructure uh, and where we're going on there. Would that, how's that, Paul? Yes, yes. Um, so the cost of the fuel is um, pretty much uh, or quite similar to the cost of aviation fuel. Uh, and when you uh, then uh, look at where we think the cost of hydrogen will go, because there seems to be a huge amount of interest across the world in creating uh, a much larger hydrogen based uh, economy and all sorts of transport um, areas, we would expect a downward pressure on the cost of the fuel itself. Um, the challenge of uh, um, using that fuel uh, in an aircraft as you picked up is, is um, one of the largest challenges is storage. Uh, the easiest way to, or the, the best way to store large amounts of, of hydrogen on an aircraft is by storing it as a liquid, but it then has to be cryogenically cooled. Uh, that doesn't really work with small aircraft, as was mentioned earlier, because of the complexity of the cryogenics that, that needs to be on the aircraft. But it's probably the way that the larger aircraft will go to store the volume of hydrogen needed. The smaller aircraft, you can get away with smaller amounts of, of hydrogen, and therefore it becomes much more practical to store it as a gas. Um, when stored as a gas, you typically... Uh, it's all about weight in aircraft and when stored as a gas, you typically for every kilogram of hydrogen you're storing, currently you have 10 kilograms of storage tank, um, that sort of ratio. So uh, that works, you can just about get to get that to work in a smaller aircraft because the amounts of hydrogen you need, you need are in the sort of um, 15, 20, 30 kilograms of, of hydrogen. So um, on the, the nine seat, um, that's uh, and, and possibly the 19 seat. That's the way it would go. It would be stored as a gas uh, in a um, a high pressure uh, tank, um, and that problem is uh, well on the, the way to being solved. Um, so hopefully that answers answers the question. I think locally, um, I've been uh, talking to all of the energy producers here in all, all of the islands, and. Um, the major electric um, uh, generation, Guernsey Electric and Jersey Electricity, are very, very keen uh, to be involved with this directly because it helps them immensely. It uh, allows them to um, smooth out their diurnal variation of uh, energy use so that any time we, are, uh, we haven't got a kettle on, they can make hydrogen. And uh, that is extremely helpful to them 
um, but they are not the correct people to deliver the hydrogen so that the uh, current hydrocarbon producers or hydrocarbon um, uh, suppliers, Rubis for instance, I'm um, also talking to and trying to get those them to talk together because what we've got with uh, this move to green sustainability, it has to be a very, very unified operation. It's got to be, that's why we've got to start at government level and coming down, then stitching all these different companies together. And my role in this has really been the last 10 months has been one of meeting, meeting, briefing, 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 lots of different people, bringing them together and saying, these, this is the art of the possible. This is what we can do. This is what we should do because this planet is no planet B. We have got to get this sorted out. And um, the faster we do it, the better but we can do it far more efficiently working together. And so that all of the energy producers, the energy um, uh, suppliers, the hydrocarbon uh, uh, companies, will be, their, their um, delivery of hydrocarbons will fall away. The use of electricity will rise. It is correct that the electrical generation um, companies will be the manufacturer of hydrogen because they can buy the electricity at the lowest rate, but the delivery of the hydrogen will be by the current hydrocarbon suppliers because they've got the technology and they've got the know-how delivery, especially when it goes airside <coughs> up the airport. Um, so we, we want to get everybody working together on this. We want to split risks across the board uh, because that's the right way to do it. And we'll have a little look at that later on. Um, but I think that that probably is uh, where we're going with that. A lady at the back there, I think you had a question and you were ignored. <laughs> I think this is um, a local bailiwick uh, question, really. So uh, you've talked about Arini. Arini aren't here today, but are they fully supportive of uh, your plans? Mm -hmm. um, and going on from that, you said that uh, you weren't asking the states of Guernsey or the states of Alderney for any funding. But currently, we are led to believe that the only profit-making route for Arini is London Gatwick. So, therefore, that leads on that the routes that you're interested on in are loss-making. So, therefore, with your alliance with Arini, will you be subsidising, will you be supporting, will you be uh, helping the people of Guernsey to avoid having to subsidise Arini from its running costs? With um, Orini had its base and uh, origins in Alderney. It was based on eight islanders. 1968, 1970, that is what they had. And they were running round all of the islands all the time. There was no problem. They were a profitable company. They changed to the Trilander, which is a derivative of the islander, and it was certified as single pilot IFR 17 seats as opposed to nine on the Islander. So that as a commercial uh, uh, aircraft, it was a, a very, very desirable aircraft. You will not get that anymore. They gave up the Trilander uh, single pilot um, uh, grandfather rights. That is gone. Nevertheless, the inter-island aspect of the tr Islander the um, economics of that work correctly, and they always have. It is on the slightly longer routes that, that Orini did uh, down to Dinar and up into the UK, where you wanted the bigger aircraft. So that within the Channel Islands, the Islander works absolutely dandy. There's no problem with that at all. As far as the uh, costing of that is concerned, currently the uh, Dornier 228, which replaced the Trilander, costs about $7 million a copy. It's got 19 seats. Islanders, piston engine islanders, you can buy a current, there's nothing wrong with them. They are fully in use and will have, they have no life in any part other than the overall lives on the engines, which are, uh, and the propellers on the carriages, but it's nothing. Um, there is no life part as, as far as the wing or, or the fuse are concerned. They cost about £350,000 each. So for, let us say, half a million pounds each for the Islanders, two of those gives you 18 seats, and that's a million pounds. 
So you're doing the same work because you've got two pilots doing that and you've got two pilots in the Dornier, but you're doing it for a seventh of the money. You tell me. That is it's a lot, lot cheaper. Now, as far as the longer range work is concerned, the Dornier, is, it is a good aircraft. There's no question about that but it's got to be used on the right routes and short range routes on turbine engine aircraft do not work. Turbines are lovely things. I've been building them for the last 50 years. Uh, they are, they're wonderful, wonderful things. I love them to bits, but they are not good on short range or short cycle work. Uh, they're very, very expensive and so that they're not the right way to go. Electric motors don't have that problem. Uh, and so that uh, they will be the correct way to go. The 19-seater then needs to be used on the longer range, 100, 150, 200 mile range work. That is where, what it was designed for. The Dornier is a three mile a minute aircraft, 180 knot aircraft. The Highlander is a two mile a minute aircraft. So we use the two mile a minute aircraft on the very short range stuff, use the three mile a minute aircraft on the slightly longer range stuff, Car, Wren, Southampton, in the UK, that type of stuff. And then it starts to make sense. That aircraft will make sense. You will make uh, a profit on it, providing it's used on the right routes. And that is why we believe we can use that aircraft, lease it from uh, Orini, and then put, give them a decent uh, uh, lease on it. So they're making their money. They've got fixed money coming in every month. That reduces their cost, their, their loss currently. 10 million pounds was forecast. It will be significantly more with COVID. It reduces their loss, but we are absolutely certain we can make that work. And we be the champions of the 10 to 20 seat aircraft, be the champions of Alderney to get their economy to lift again, which is a bailiwick problem. Alderney's situation is dire. It has to be addressed. And uh, part of that, and a very, very significant part of that is uh, connectivity air connectivity. We need to get that really working hard, but we're not reinventing anything. This, is, this happened. Orini did it for 35 years. They did it highly successfully. All we're doing is replicating that. And it, there's nothing clever about it. It's, um, uh, it's, it's good fun. It'll be fun. <laughs> It'll work. You got a mic? Mark Billet. Alderney. Just a question around the ownership, if you want, or the uh, funding around the first islander that's going to go green. This has puzzled me all the way along. As I understand it, that islander is actually owned, if you want to call it, by Cranfield Aerospace as part of the Frisian pro projects. Okay. Where exactly is there a commitment for those air, that aircraft in its testing program to actually operate in the Channel Islands. Is there a firm agreement in place between yourselves being Mark Harrison Aviation or Green Air or yeah. <laughs> whatever the name changes to and, and Cranfield Aerospace on that plane coming here as a green asset? That I'm still not clear of because, because that's quite important. If we've been talked at for a lot of the time over the years and uh, nothing seems to happen occasionally. So it would be, it's important for, shall I say, us across the board to understand there is commitment from the uh, Frisian projects to Cranfield Aerospace that that plane is committed to coming here. The, the test aircraft? Correct. Well, it's got to be tested somewhere. It will be, uh, initially the testing will occur at Cranfield and Paul will be, they've got a, another aircraft up there at the moment under test, in fact they've got loads of aircraft up there under test, but uh, on, in relation to this, they've got the Zero Avia Malibu, which is a hydro, uh, hydrogen fuel cell aircraft on test there. Um, and the Islander, when that is on test in about 30 months time, initially the testing will be done up in the uh, Cranfield area because it, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Uh, but when we want to do the route testing of the aircraft and, and to give it its operational, um, uh, the operational aspects of its testing, 
uh, that will occur, part of that will occur down here, but it's got to occur somewhere, and this is part of why we're the lead uh, launch platform for the operation. Now, the relationship between myself and to get clarity on that, Harrison Aviation, me, I've been doing all of the research on this, uh, on this side of it for the last 10 months. Uh, that's all been funded by me personally. As far as Green Air is concerned, Green Air will be the operating uh, company down here, based down here. So that, and, and Harrison Aviation will step back from that at that point because that won't be an appropriate uh, um, link. It needs to be a local well, base. Would that be a, a, an appropriate point for me, David Haler, to just say a few words about Green Air financing? Please, which, David, yeah. Ca can people hear me okay? Good morning, uh, my name's David Haler and I'm in charge of the gaining of the finance for both the e-flight system, which is essentially the technology company, and Green Air, which will apply it in the Channel Islands. So, following on from your question, sir, I think you're, you're asking really what is the feasibility of green air starting and and i have to i'm delighted to say that the support across the three islands has been superb in that all three islands will will be involved and we have got essentially investor champions on each island and if i say that we've had indications and it's very early stage but indications of between one to two million investment from each of those champions, you can see that we're a long way down our road to achieving the seven million, which we want to seed this project for the Channel Islands. So it's very much more than a feasibility and another possible maybe. This, as Mark said earlier in his presentation, is plan to start Easter next year. So there have been some questions of where we're going to get the Islanders, and Mark's answered that very correctly. There is a, a, a ready supply of these aircraft we've identified already. Uh, so the, the project is very much up and running. We are now topping and tailing our own financial uh, forecasts and we are getting ready to come to the Channel Islands in October with a roadshow to put it before the people because uh, we are hoping in addition to the large investor champions from each island that we will make it open for all people to invest in this exciting project which will uh, be done via a crowdfunding platform. So it's going to be the people's operation. Mark has outlined the reduction in, in emissions that we're achieving, but at the end of it all, the bottom line is the Islanders will get a more efficient service at a lower cost using the technology that Paul and his team at Cranfield are developing. I, I've, I've been in the project a little less than the, the other team members. However, I've been in, very impressed by the risk management and there is continual support by the UK government right up the way to Boris Johnson. Uh, the grant shops, the, uh, the transport minister continually refers to the technology at Cranfield, but the important thing for the Channel Islands, you have the perfect scenario to launch this whole operation. We're dedicated to do that, and we can make it start next Easter, mainly through the wonderful support that we are already having indications uh, from your fellow islanders so it's not a feasibility it's a reality and it's coming and we're looking forward to providing that service using all the learning that has gone before 
with the Orini, with Joey, all of those operations brought together to give you a robust service. Sorry, can I just finish the question that I asked? Because it still hasn't been answered. I need to understand where there is a, a letter of understanding in place between Cranfield Aerospace, which will own the electric Islander, and with the company Green Air, or whatever here in the Channel Islands, but that technology will come here, do the route, and we'll be a f uh, in the position as a first mover to actually take on that and develop it going forward. Because the whole presentation is based on green air. But I'm really not clear that there is a written commitment between the owner of the technology uh, being developed, which is Cranfield Aerospace, okay. and and yep. this this organization that i'm unclear about and we could fall apart yep. if i understand okay i think i it's Thank slightly you. difficult and quiet but i think i picked up the basics of of your question what is the relationship between the technology i.e cranfield aerospace systems and green air um well in simple terms it's money because five million of our rays goes to eFlight Systems, which is the Cranfield technology. Two million goes to the establishment of Green Air. Further details will be uh, made available at the roadshow, but there is an extremely close liaison between the technology and the operator. And we think that will speed the introduction of this technology. So uh, the very fact that uh, Paul Hutton is, is with us today is an indication of that close liaison. But all I can say is it, it will be over the coming years via Mark, your, your own representative, he will be liaising and working very closely with the project team at Cranfield to make sure we achieve that amazing uh, STC date of 30 months. And uh, they've got a good track record, so we're, we're confident they're going to make it. But does that answer your question? Yes, there really is a very, very tight relationship driven by money. Ben, ben. You. Can I mention the emotional side of this? Um, most interesting people will live their lives uh, with balanced risk. They will go skiing, water skiing, they'll jump out of, with parachutes. And if it all goes wrong, well, it's been a more interesting death than dying by dementia in a bed. Um, however, in the era of the grounding of the entire Boeing MAX fleet for over a year, uh, and coupled with, uh, I would imagine that most pilots will say that flying in these islands can be a wee bit challenging with the winds that we have here. How are we going to show to the passengers that they are safe sitting in the seats of this new technology and it's a risk they're prepared to take? Well, uh, the, the um, Islander is well um, established here. It's been flying in the Channel Islands for... for 50 years, 45 years. <laughs> the, the STC that will provide that will provide a, uh, a system which is completely certified in the same way as any other system in any aircraft existing flying. There's nothing new about that, that process. Now, as far as the local weather conditions are concerned, um, the islanders have been flying in these conditions all the time. There's not an issue here. Uh, they've got a big wing. All of the big wing aircraft take the, the bumps uh, the way they do, but there's nothing new about that. So that I fully understand your concern where you're saying that this is a new technology and therefore uh, what emotional um, uh, risk mitigation can we provide for that. But what it will be is that the... Uh, the um, by then, four 
Piston Engine Islanders will be operating in the islands <coughs> and they will be uh, exactly as they've always been. They're just functioning day in, day out as they have very, very reliable aircraft. The Electric Islander will then come in as a prototype aircraft uh, on tests. It will not have passengers in it, but it will have sandbags in it. It will be loaded <coughs> up in the correct manner to provide uh, an aircraft uh, that is um, in an operational situation exactly the same as it will be. It will then fly the routes and fly the routes and fly the routes in all weather circumstance because what we're seeking to do with the aircraft is to find the little corners that we are not aware of. Now, that's one of the reasons that we're using the Islander is to reduce that risk mitigation or, or to, to, to mitigate the risk. So we know the aircraft, we know all of its normal problems, of its undercarriages, its wings, its ailerons, all of that. All of those problems are known. The only bit you're, is unknown and the bit we're seeking experience on will be the uh, hydrogen fuel cells and the motors. So we're keeping that risk to it very, very minimum. The reason we're doing it on twin engine aircraft, the same reason we do twins on everything, is that they are completely separate systems. Each, air, each engine has its own hydrogen fuel cell, it's got its own uh, control systems, and that's the way aviation has been forever. So that, uh, um, that's, that's why you've got multi-engine aircraft. I fully understand your concerns, but by the time you get into an electric aircraft, it will be completely sorted out. It will be exactly the same as any other new aircraft. Okay. Yeah. Um, given the inclement weather that we experience regularly here in the islands, Guernsey, Jersey and Alderney, um, what sort of range or probably more importantly endurance are you expecting on the Islanders and the Dorniers as far as your models are concerned? Well, the Islanders are the ones we're focusing on at the moment and to do a 15 minute flight between the islands here, um, a, a, any aircraft to do that on instruments requires about an hour and a half's fuel minimum. Um, and the, the requirement that uh, um, Paul has to achieve uh, in Cranfield is that the aircraft, the electric aircraft, when it comes down here, will have at least that capability because otherwise we're not going to use it. Nobody can use it. And so that the challenge that he has had is to reduce uh, the new fit weight to allow enough energy to be in that aircraft to achieve that hour and a half um, uh, endurance. And um, that is why you will see worldwide in the early stages of electrification of aircraft, they are aiming at shorter range uh, operations. And some of them will be aiming at visual flight only uh, because you can reduce that a little bit further. Um, but in actual fact, in this case, the Islander, it will have full capability, exactly the same as the um, Piston Engine Islander. But where the Piston Engine Island has an endurance of about six hours, this will be at a minimum of an hour and a half. That would allow the aircraft to go, um, let us say, uh, Alderney Guernsey, not get into Guernsey because it's rubbish, and need to uh, go down to Jersey. And, uh, so, and that's the normal routing, and to land with full, intact uh, endurance, uh, um, uh, the reserves. So he'll land with his 30 minutes plus 10% plus all the other bits and bobs he has to land with. Uh, thank you. So I didn't introduce myself before. John Asia, intellectual property economist. I'd like to pick up on the intellectual property side again, but particularly with your question of back there referred to a letter of understanding. I think David in the UK said, and it's all about the money, which yes, both are true, but critical to that, given that uh, the intellectual property would be owned by Cranfield and the STSs, will be the licensing of the intellectual property. Mm. Um, and for example, if exclusive licenses are provided and the, and the terms of that will be absolutely critical to green air in terms of its ongoing operation and its market position. Would you like to comment, Mark, David, or Paul, 
on that particular aspect? I, I don't know who's, who's still on there, but I can definitely answer that very easily. Sure. Um, STCs are a supplementary type certificate, and they, when you agree to the owner of that supplementary type certificate to purchase that modification, the rights to use it and the rights to have it in your aircraft transfer with that purchase of the modification. So uh, you, you would not you would not own the STC. The STC remains with the, man of, uh, with the, with the um, Cranfield in this case, um, but you will have the right to use it. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, if you like, a licensed product. But the uh, STCs are used worldwide with aviation. There's millions of them. They, are, they go from this type of thing uh, to you know, lightweight, undercarriage or whatever it is, they're all done by STC, um, but it's the ownership of the STC and the ownership of the responsibility that STC uh, provides. Somebody, somewhere, has got to be responsible for that. In the same way, it's a supplementary type certificate, but the type certificate itself, the TC, is owned by, uh, in this case, uh, Britain Norman. They own the type certificate uh, and Cranfield own the supplementary type certificate. Yeah. It's been very interesting listening to this debate, and I'm very interested in the project altogether. Um, you mentioned that you're collaborating with, obviously, the power providers, with Oringi, and most importantly, the states of, of the islands. Um, is somebody also looking at greening the airports? Because it seems to me a oh, huge... Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, in fact, uh, uh, Paul and David, you're still there. Um, I think that these questions will come in very soon because I've got three or four more slides to finish up. What I'd like to do is to aim anything you want at David and Paul now, and then the last little bit we'll aim that sort of question, which is local. Has anybody else got anything else for, uh, on the technical or financial side? Uh, in, in competition, if you like, there's also the uh, pilotless aircraft. Um, I saw a video last week of Airbus who've done their first sort of drone type um, takeoff and landing. Where do you see the future of pilotless aircraft in this whole green air future, please? Paul, is that one for you? Yes, um, so uh, unmanned aircraft uh, are definitely on the roadmap. Um, I don't think they will be moving people around uh, in the short to medium term. So even if you look at uh, one of the main uh, focuses for that type of technology is, is what's called the VTOLs, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, and you may have, uh, be aware of a project that we've got running in parallel with Fresson uh, we call it Project Imogen, which we launched with Aston Martin Lagonda at um, uh, the Farnborough Air Show two years ago. Um, and that is an uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But even that, which is um, very much um, at the cutting edge of, of aircraft technology, will start off piloted uh, because we recognize that whilst many of the technologies are already available that would allow a uh, pilotless, uh, aircraft that could carry people. Unfortunately, the regulatory environment that would allow that technology to operate isn't there and will take a long time for us to build the confidence to allow that, uh, I say a long time, it will take quite a few years yet for us to get to the place where we will allow that technology to be adopted in the same way that if you look at cars now, many of the cars, uh, the newer cars on the road, such as Tesla's, have much of the sensors and the technology that would allow the car to drive itself. But the regulations are lagging that because, quite rightly, they're taking longer to ensure that that safety can be proven. So I think it's quite a few years yet before the pilots are replaced in these aircraft. But it is something that is on the roadmap. Well, a couple of points. I see Jane, who has worked at senior level in IT for States of Guernsey. One point is, I don't understand all these things, but the snag with Tridents or Dorniers or even Islanders is they are vintage technology in their 
origins and have been safe workhorses for many, many years and will be for many years. Um, but how easy is it to adapt that technology to digital transformation because people today and tomorrow, investors and insurers and passengers and professionals will demand that. And moving on from that, whilst everyone's in the room, I was really interested to hear about the marine possibilities and, and think that Channel Islands are an ideal test bed for marine power. Well, I think you can talk of seaplanes, which is a bit loose, but perhaps, you know, the marine past ferries. But the snag with Channel Island waters is you not only need quality speed, you need comfort, because you can get very sick bouncing up and down. And so my question is, how can you ensure, unlike perhaps Spain, that we could have really robust technology from, say, Guernsey to Alderney or Guernsey to Jersey that can still get there in less than an hour? Because once it starts taking 90 minutes, two hours, it's not competitive. I think that you're talking about hull technology, not propulsion. Uh, but, uh, and so I, I think, with great respect, John, I, I'd, I'd be wary to go down that road. The hull technology is there. If you want to go fast, you put big, bigger motors in it. Um, but the, as far as... Uh, yeah, and so it could, be, it could be diesel, it could be anything. Um, so that I think that in that sense, I'd be inclined to say if you're looking for stability of ride in marine world, you, there is lots to do that, lots to, to allow that to be capable of doing that, um, but it has got nothing to do with the propulsion system. Um, as far as the aircraft being um, of a vintage, that's very, very true, but in actual fact, what we are doing with this aircraft, you're moving from one world to the next. The um, laws of physics haven't changed, the shape of a hull or the shape of an aircraft are not altering dramatically currently. There's no reason for them to alter because the laws of physics haven't changed. What we're trying to do is to make the aircraft more and more and more efficient. One way in which that's being done is to lighten them so that the project Fresson 4, the 90-seater, uh, when that comes into being, that aircraft is likely, you will see aerodynamic changes in that. It will be a far more blended um, fuselage to wing structure. They're f more efficient. They will be manufacturing up at Cranfield. They'll be manufacturing those hulls or those fuselage and wing structures there because they, they're capable of doing that there. And um, that's the way that will go. But as far as the Islander, and if you look back um, further, the aircraft, the helicopter I first flew, um, or, uh, commercially, the S61, that flew in 1958, uh, and it is still a highly, highly valued aircraft. The laws of physics don't change. That aircraft is, is absolutely in service worldwide, as is the Islander, as is the Twin Otter, same sort of vintage, as is the Beaver. They're there, but you should not confuse the age of design with their capability. And in fact, in, in the, uh, if you look at all of these aircraft, they're all constantly being modified, 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 just to be lighter, faster, better. And that's all we're doing here. Um, so that the aircraft, if you got into a 1965 Islander and you get into one of these, they're completely different aircraft. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Graham Laflemme, I'm a retired engineer. Just curious, um, I understand the logic of using the Islander uh, as, uh, with, with fewest changes as possible. I was just curious as to whether uh, maybe a next stage, uh, I've seen that you can have powered uh, main wheels for taxiing and for assisted takeoff. Is, what's the sort of um, trade-off between uh, reducing energy balance uh, of the extra complication of uh, powered wheels to uh, minimize energy during taxiing and takeoff compared to the extra complication of the plane. Just, just curious. So Paul, that's one for you, please. Yes, I, I, the sound was a little broken up, but I, I think 
it was about whether we're looking to use things such as assisted takeoff. I presume you mean uh, you mean driving um, the aircraft down the runway using electro motors turning its wheels as opposed to pulling it along with the propellers. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I think what what drives you to start to look at things like that is, is when you're trying to squeeze every uh, last uh, element of, of energy out of your power source. And, and when you're looking at a pure battery aircraft, you know, that's one of the, the, the key challenges. You've got a, a certain amount of energy density in the battery pack and you're trying to maximize what you get from that. So it can be more efficient just to turn the wheels to get the aircraft down the runway and up to speed than to use the slightly more inefficient way of getting it um, down the runway using the propellers. The, 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 the problem that gives you with a, 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 a battery uh, system is that once you've added that extra weight of some additional motors to turn the wheels, uh, you've then you're using more energy to then get that extra weight off the ground when you get in the air. So it, it can be it can be self-defeating when you go to a more energy dense uh, fuel source. So uh, looking at uh, hydrogen for fuel cells, you've got a, um, a much greater density of energy in that basic fuel, then you're not quite so constrained and and therefore um, the need to do that is less and you're not as willing to accept the weight. So I think the way that the, that we're heading now with that aspect is to try and keep the propulsion system as simple as possible because we no longer need uh, to, um, uh, to deal with a very limited amount of energy that a, a, a battery uh, can store uh, once we're looking at a, an energy dense solution such as, as hydrogen. So they're interesting, but at this stage, um, I suspect less likely that we'd go for that sort of complexity. I've got about four or five more slides to the end of this, and I suspect that um, both Paul and uh, David, uh, I know that Paul has definitely got other stuff that he needs to get on with. So that, Paul, um, David, can we probably call your bit? Thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, I'll wrap this up here in the next 10 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll um, meet up later in the day, I'm sure. Thank you very much for the invitation to join. Thank you very yes. much, David. Thank you. And Paul. OK. Is, uh, now, the, the last few uh, questions or last few slides I've got here it's really to do with um, just where we are in this. Uh, the operation has got, um, uh, we're actively seeking investment now. Up until now, we haven't really um, been at the correct point in that. Um, but now we're looking right the way across the islands. And as David was saying, we are uh, looking for champions in each island because we want this to be an absolute pan channel island operation. Um, the initial part of that is underway. We've got very, very significant interest in Jersey. In Guernsey, uh, uh, are we doing extremely well? But I've been here a bit more, so it's been easier for me to, to um, uh, bring that together. And in Alderney, I'll be going up to Alderney on the weekend uh, and to specifically um, take that forward. But we're also looking for event sponsors. Now, part of this is that we're getting a lot of people interested in it but they may not be able to look at um, the uh, direct investment in, or may not wish to look at the direct investment, but they will wish to be associated with this and that we want them to be associated with it so that where people are um, wanting to be um, in, uh, associated with this, we would love to hear from them. We'd love them to, to sponsor some aspect of these sort of seminars, which there will be uh, a number of in the future and we want to hear from them, so please uh, make, make your voice known. As far as the investment prospectus is concerned, I think David's just cleared now, but that will be produced in uh, the next um, uh, few weeks. That will be put out to everybody. It'll be a formal document. You'll see exactly what you're going to get. Your question of legal uh, ties to different, um, uh, different parts of this project, that will be fulfilled in there. I, I do actually have, there is legal uh, memorandums of understanding between myself and uh, a Fresson. Those, those already exist. Um, but it didn't actually cover the, the specific point of that prototype aircraft. Um, so that's that one. The collaborations that we're doing, well, we're doing that with all of the main 
um, um, uh, operations here. But certainly, I'm working as hard as I can with the, the, the states of Guernsey, states of Albany, states of Jersey, uh, and all of the um, um, those in between, the entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, and industry. But we are looking and we are in negotiation with uh, uh, all of the political parties, absolutely. What you're here today is one of a series of um, uh, seminars which are absolutely focused on the October the 7th um, uh, election. We need to make sure that every single candidate who puts themselves forward uh, has the maximum amount of knowledge of the um, green and um, requirements in the Channel Islands, what is available to them. So all of the energy providers, the financiers, the corporations and the individuals, we're speaking to them all as fast and as much as I can now. There is this immense will across the Channel Islands and in fact the UK to address this renewable energy, sustainable energy and electric aviation. There's this massive interest in electric aviation and uh, that's, it's happening now. So there we go. What are we going to be asking for the states of Guernsey? And I, there he is, he's jumped up now, I can see. So, so, uh, the bit we're going to be asking is absolutely the owners of Orini are, are STSB. They are the people who control uh, Orini. We are the employers of STSB. We, are, we pay their salary. So it is up to us to tell STSB is to tell our candidates as states members what we want and we must tell them what we want as far as Orini are concerned. Orini has been taking these massive losses over the years, but it doesn't need to. It is a, it's a fine airline. I've got an awful lot of time for Orini, but it has to have the right instructions. If it's given the wrong instructions, what comes out the end will be wrong. And so I don't think that I would not criticise Orini in any way. What I would say is, is that their owners, STSB, uh, need to give them the correct instruction. Now, we will be searching for the PSOs out of Alderney, public service obligations, but we don't believe we're going to invoke them because we believe that using the islanders, that safety net, which is what it is, will not be required. Similarly, in Alderney. The one that is not in the gift of the states of Guernsey, but we do need to look at, is the um, way in which air operators are allowed to operate within the Channel Islands. We believe there needs to be this French model where the states of each island own the airport and run the airport for the, uh, to allow all of their... their to, um, to allow everything else to happen, knowing that you won't make a profit from that airport, but it does enable everything. And in that same sense, we believe that the inter-island routes are an, uh, an enabling facility for the whole of the Channel Islands. We will be looking to make sure that the islander operation is more or less exactly what it was 30 years ago when Orini were running it then, and it's that they were effectively a benign monopoly operating within the Channel Islands, all the Channel Islands, because that is the only efficient way you can operate a airline for such a small number of people in the Channel Islands. It's only 170,000 people. It's not big enough. To, it's not, not a big enough market. Those are the benefits that we're aiming at. We're going to reduce costs, going to be doing green as well as talking green, improving the service, improving tourism, High-tech new employment, there will definitely be that. We'll be sending out teams from here to embody those STCs right the way across the world. This will be a centre of, tech, uh, of excellence and those teams will be going out from Guernsey to, to fit the STC in Mauritius, in the Falkland Islands. Um, hello, everybody in the Falkland Islands who's listening in. I know they are. And uh, they've got five islanders down there. I've operated those islanders myself down there when I was there. Um, they want this technology. We'll be fitting it in conjunction with them. And we will significantly help COVID-19. So it's a small island, big, big um, um, uh, commitment there. Our commitments are inward investment, safe operations, sustainability, reduced costs, and affordable fares. And that's really what we're aiming at. 
and we can do it with the electric aviation. Your commitment, please, please, please vote. If you do that, if you can't vote for some reason, you've, you've not put your number in there, you get, nine, you, know, you get one out of ten for that, but you can um, uh, email your um, deputies on that, but just get engaged with the political uh, thing. And there we are. Green together, yes we can. You'll find on this, um, this PowerPoint, anybody who wants the PowerPoint, please contact me. You've got your little cards there and I'll send you one. Um, and this one will be emailable, won't be a problem. There's lots and lots of different people supporting what we're doing. That's an ever-growing list and that's it. Thank you very, very much for your time. Well done. Thank, you. Good. Thank you all for coming.